Hey everybody, it's Will here coming at you with a uh, bonus Chapo episode today. It's a bit of a week of railroads here in the U.S. with a, a tentative agreement uh, just about to be imposed on uh, railroad workers in the name of averting a strike. So we're going to get into that today. Uh, joined by uh, Jonah Furman, a journalist at Labor Notes, and Ross Gruders, co-chair of Railroad Workers United, and Devin Mance of BMW ED Teamsters. Now, uh, so I'd like to get into the tentative agreement that's just been opposed and with the Congress, the White House, all of that. But I'd just like to begin as a, a fan of trains and the people who operate them. I'd like to begin by asking our two uh, real life train heads, I guess uh, beginning with you, Devin, if you could just uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from, uh, what your job is and your perspective on the conditions at the railroads and your relationship with management that led to this current moment. So, uh, Devin, I'll begin with you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Will. Uh, so I'm a Brotherhood of Maintenance Away employees. Basically, we fix the tracks. We build uh, buildings. We build the bridges. Uh, we construct tracks, the ties, the rail. Uh, when they break, we fix them. Um, we don't do a whole lot of pre-maintenance uh, anymore because we're running around with our heads cut off, it seems like now. But... Uh, we do not drive the trains. The trains destroy our tracks, and we fix them after the trains destroy them. So the, the trains are your enemy, it, you could say. You're, you're fighting against the trains to keep be, the trains yeah, running. Sometimes they, can. <laughs> they, they don't like to let us out on the track too much fixing because they, they want the trains running, which is which is all right, too. So, yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I work for BNSF uh, Railroad. I'm from North Dakota, and uh, we started a caucus called Rank and File United within the the uh, BMW ED, a reform caucus. And, uh, yeah. So anything else that you wanted to know? Uh, no, and I guess just moving on to, to Ross, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, where you're from and, uh, what your job is like? Hi everyone. I'm Ross Gritters. I'm, uh, based out of central Iowa. I'm co-chair with railroad workers United. I'm a locomotive engineer. So I'm the one that's destroying Devin's, uh, fine handiwork, uh, and, and Devin's definitely uh, a part of the crew that, that keeps us safe and keeps the, the trains moving down the tracks. Uh, I, I think uh, my relationship with uh, management is uh, largely one of uh, avoidance. I try to avoid them because uh, uh, they don't have uh, my best interests in mind and uh, what, uh, what we want is a, a opposed to what they want. And so uh, the, the boss is obviously not my friend. Um, so that leads us to this current moment where we're fighting for what we deserve. Well, in terms of uh, what you deserve, um, I mentioned, uh, Jonah, could you like chime in on the state of this tentative agreement and like how it came to essentially be imposed by the White House and Congress and like the, you know, the, the sick leave, I know the sick leave um, was the, the big issue at play here, like the, that, that was put into a separate bill, which won't pass the Senate. I mean, it would pass if they didn't need to break a filibuster, but it doesn't have 60 votes in the Senate. So that's going nowhere. What you're left with is this quote unquote tentative agreement. Could you talk about what's in the tentative agreement? And then maybe Devin and Ross, could you talk about like how you and um, fellow union members feel about what you're left with uh, in terms of this agreement? Yeah, I mean, in terms of how we got here, the thing people should understand is that negotiations on the railroads, because of a history of striking and sending in the National Guard and shutting down the whole economy, have this special laws over it, the Railway Labor Act, that basically provides for the federal government to have a heavy role, a lot of intervention uh, in the contract negotiations. So what we saw this week is the end of three years of negotiations with no raises in that period. And essentially, we got to the end of the line where it came down to it. Are the railroad workers really going to strike or is Joe Biden going to impose what the employers want on these workers? And Joe Biden decided that we are going to impose uh, a contract that was rejected by the membership. The overview of the tentative agreement, what they're actually what's at stake here. I mean, I think the thing people talk about is it was a 24 percent raise. That's over five years, including three of which have already not had a raise. Um, the big thing became no sick time. There's no, I mean, there, there has never been sick time for rail workers and, you know, sick time kind of, uh, Ross and Devin, you can say, but I feel like it stood in for the basic idea of we're overworking these people and there's no time off the job and you don't really have a life if you're a railroad worker, especially if you're in the operating crafts, meaning you're 
riding the train, driving the train. So it became the flagship demand that at least can we get seven paid sick days after a pandemic uh, for a group of workers who are facing extreme, um, you know, harassment from management about if you miss a day, you could lose a job that you've had for 20 years. So that became the flagship demand. And in the end, the question was, can we even get this? I mean, Devin and Ross can say this was not this is not what's going to fix the railroad system. Seven paid sick days is a little Band-Aid on this thing. But even that was a bridge too far for the Democratic Party leadership. And, and for the unions, it was like, are we really going to throw down? And there was a lot of showdown moments where, you know, I think, I think in a lot of ways, the unions blinked when the members were ready to walk. Uh, and that's a big part of what happened, too. Uh, Devin and Ross, your thoughts on uh, where things stand now with this tentative agreement? Uh, yeah, I'll go first. If you don't mind, Ross. Um, just real quick, uh, I, it is a 22 percent raise. Uh, 24 keeps getting thrown around, but it, it's a big it's a big difference. It compounded is 24. Yeah, yeah. And that's why that keeps getting thrown around. But um, yeah, and look. They, they keep touting about our health care and how great it is, but now that's going up. They keep saying that, that that's not going to go up and, and that that's going up on January 1st and then every year from after that. And it gets capped out at almost $400. So like a month. So it's, it's not premium health care anymore. That being said, uh, you know, we did uh, fight like hell at the very end here, but it was, it was a few people that were really fighting like hell here. Uh, there, it's been a lot of work throughout years, and uh, Brother Gruders knows exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, the, these guys have been fighting for a long time for this kind of stuff and just for rank and file participation. And I, I push back a little bit and say that, you know, Republicans really let us down. I mean, I know their leadership in the Democratic Party, they, they fucked up a bit, right? And I can nitpick, and, and I will happily do that. But overwhelmingly, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party decided that we didn't need paid sick leave. And, you no, know, I keep seeing over and over that, well, if we're so special and, you know, we can't shut down the economy, you know, we'd shut, you know, the whole world down and all this different crazy stuff. If we're that important, that we're that essential, but we can't get seven days paid sick leave. And people are going, like, people are going mad seeing it and just thinking, what the hell is going on? This this seems like not a big ask. They're not asking for more money, although, you know, not a bad thing, right? No, nobody's ever going to turn that down. But we're all we're asking for is seven days paid sick leave, just to be able to stay at home. If your kid is sick, if you're sick, you don't be dragging your illnesses around. I mean, I don't need to go through in detail the reason why we need it. It seems pretty obvious. Um, and so it's it's been very sickening uh, to watch. And it came down to the final hours and. Uh, you know, we, it, it failed on us uh, due to the filibuster, as you said, and, and that's really frustrating. Yeah. I just follow up on that and say that r- railroad workers sort of always knew this was the culmination of the process. We knew that Congress would under the terms of the railway labor act would, uh, I- impose an agreement and put us back to work. We just didn't know when that was going to occur and what those terms were going to be. And so at the, at the finish line there, what was really the focus was, getting everything we could get. And the, the seven day sick leave, uh, again, it's, it's sort of a placebo for, for all the ills that we're facing, the inadequate staffing and, and the working uh, faster, doing more work with fewer people. And uh, it was, it was uh, frustrating to see the filibuster. I tried to explain this to a coworker yesterday. And, you know, normally when you score more points than the other team, you win. And I'm, telling my coworker that, uh, yeah, we got 52 votes for the seven days paid sick leave and 43 against. And, uh, he was like, so it passed. I'm like, no, it failed. We we have the (laughs) filibuster and, and, you know, explaining that. And, and he, he just says to me, he says very seriously, he's like, well, if their if their goal is to make us lose faith in the democratic process, they're succeeding. And, and that's it right there. I think, you know, Senate Republicans and, and Joe Biden let us down. Well, I mean, you talk about like uh, the railroads are in an interesting position because of this, like the the National Railway Act, which gives Congress the leeway to intervene in labor disputes because of how important things like, you know, running freight is to the supply chain. Um, So like the sick leave thing is is fascinating because what the what these rail carriers are essentially arguing is that we cannot maintain our supply chains in this country we cannot keep freight moving around this country if we give our the people who operate the trains even like one <laughs> paid sick day so 
if trains are that important that Congress can like essentially strike break or inter- intervene between management and labor negotiations, what does it say about these rail companies that they can't keep trains running if their employees get time off, like paid sick leave to take care of a kid or just not spread illness at their workplace? The freight rail system in this country is already failing. They're treating it as a bank. They're just cashing out and, and they're taking that wealth and, and, taking it away from the American people. Like we're already facing the effects of, uh, you know, similar to what we would with a strike, you know, with inflation and, and with the supply chain and uh, with not being able to get the, the, the goods and services we need, like that's already occurring on a smaller scale. And these railroads are a part of doing that. Yeah. I'll add something to that. You know, uh, as, as you were referring to, Look, the supply chain is fragile, right? And people didn't really realize what was going on behind their back, right? They're just doing their everyday thing. And now COVID happened and we're having this big supply chain issues and all this different stuff going on. And we're, and we're seeing these issues. But this is all not just COVID related, right? People keep thinking that, oh, it's just just because, uh, you know, we shut down the country and all these different plans stopped and all, you know, got completely backed up. Absolutely, that's that's an issue and part of it, too. But that is not even close to the whole thing. The whole story, you got to include the railroads in this. They have been shutting down lines. They've been shutting down yards. They've been shutting down uh, maintenance uh, uh, buildings with carmen that, that fix these cars. I mean, it's, it's maddening to see how much stuff they's, they've actually shut down. Not only that, but their, their uh, shippers are having an issue, uh, like tons of issues, tons of delays, uh, I live in North Dakota. We're a big egg and energy state, and you, I've heard nothing but complaining from the shippers in in my area. And and that's not just here; that is all across the country. And I'm sure if you know you went across the world, you'd see the same thing too. That that uh, the American shippers are are fucking up right now, and that's a large part due to the railroads. And so we can't just blame it on that. But like, look, if if you can't give your your employees some paid sick leave because so many people are quitting and like you have major workforce uh, shortages you can't hire anybody because you suck then like why wouldn't you want to take care of those employees it's just it's it's maddening to me and I was talking to a guy about this yesterday it just when you think about it all it like blows your mind to just think about uh, the, the things that they do I, I don't know how they're still in business I really don't and, and this contract was because of the, the inadequate staffing. Like they're trying to fit the operating model through the terms of this contract. And, and so it's, the problems are going to continue to get worse as more and more people quit this industry and, and go and find someplace better to work where they can live their lives outside of their work. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, what it's like to work for these companies. Uh, I read in uh, this is uh, something from the, the the Intercept article about this. It mentions that uh, rail companies like uh, uh, Union Pacific and uh, Norfolk Southern uh, often compete for the first and second lowest ratings on Glassdoor for any employer in the U.S. And you know, you talk about these companies like Union Pacific or uh, BNSF, or two of the big ones that I've read about. Um, their money spends in D.C. and um, you know, one of the things I've, I've read in the coverage of this is that essentially the rail companies knew that Congress was always going to intervene and they're always going to intervene to like to avert any labor action on behalf of the, uh, in, you know, in, on the part of the unions. So essentially the unions never had any leverage to begin with. So if they've bought essentially a checkmate against any labor action, what they're also buying for themselves is the right to operate the freight system in this country with as few workers as possible in as unsafe conditions as possible. People should talk about precision scheduled railroading. So it's like there's an actual policy that we're going to cut as much labor as possible out of the system. And the reason they can do it, so so in the past five years, they've cut 30% of the workers on some of these lines. In the past 20 years, literally 50,000 rail workers disappeared. And it's not because there's less freight to move. Part of it is because these are, there's, you know, six or seven companies, but they're all monopolies. Like you have your routes, you have your shippers that you need to, that you have a captured market of, you hold 30 to 40% of the freight in the country. There's, you can't just build another rail line next to the existing one and compete. So there's no penalty for them sucking at their job. Like if you can't really run a train system, there's no financial penalty for you as an employer. So your incentive becomes 
how can I, like Devin's talking about people quitting and you can't attract people. The railroad companies see that and they're happy about it. I mean, it's great. They're trying to drop pensions, drop benefits, drop salaries as much as possible. That's the business model because there's no, what's the threat? They can't strike and they you can't have any competition and you can just buy back your stock. And, you know, it's very telling that Warren Buffett is one of the biggest owners of these railroads. He doesn't pick losers. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a great business model if you own a railroad company. And uh, I guess like you're talking about the, this model of, you know, do more with less, as few people as possible, as much as possible, with as few lines as possible, just to make the most amount of money. Uh, uh, Ross, I mean, Ross and Devin, for you, uh, like, how, how does that manifest in your day-to-day work life? I mean, what is it, what is it like? How, did, like? how do these problems like metastasize when you're trying to do essentially impossible tasks in the time given? Yeah, so uh, the typical freight uh, engineer conductor is on call 24-7, 365 days a year. They don't know when they're going to work. Uh, somebody with just a couple of years experience might have 19 paid days off a year and that's it. Other than that, their life is largely unpredictable. And so when we're, we're talking about trying to schedule things, whether it be family time or time to just take personal care and, and um, go to the doctor, it, it is very difficult to manage those things. And the, the pressure as we've lost people in the industry and we're doing more work with fewer people is enormous. It is an unsafe job. And, and we're, we're being asked to uh, really do the impossible. We're being asked to physically and mentally push ourselves to the breaking point. And, and that is a, a part of the operating model and a part of the goal. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that um, system-wide. It's not just the, the equipment and the track that is failing, and we're seeing more derailments and, and more injuries and fatalities. It is the, the people themselves. We're, we're being broken by this. And the only way out of it is to remove that financial equation. I, I, I mean, I think near and dear to hopefully most of your listeners is we need to push to take this back into the hands of the public and run it just like we would the interstate highways of the airports and nationalize this thing so that it works for the public good of all people. Yeah, I mean, like like you said, like they they've uh, these railroad companies have accrued for themselves the right to have a near monopoly on vital public infrastructure that they're running into the ground. And if they if they can't run, if they can't make you know to use the cliche, if they can't make the trains run on time, then I think the the state absolutely there should be public ownership of railroads in this country. They, like the state needs to step in and operate them so that it delivers freight. It does what it's designed to do, and that like maybe like uh, making as much profit as possible needs to take a back seat to having like you know railroads work in this country. Well, let's be clear about something. There, there are actual laws in the books that you know they were formed into these giant companies now, these giant corporations, n- not just because they wanted to, but because the government allowed that to happen, uh, saying that they would have they would have good service. I can't remember the exact terminology that's used in the in the language and the laws, but they essentially are supposed to be. They're breaking the law, but it's who makes those decisions? Well, it's uh, who says they're breaking the law? Well, right now it's the Surface Transportation Board. Well, who's saying that they're fucking up right now? The Surface Transportation Board. What do they do about it? You can't do anything. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? There's there's not a thing you can do. You can't like go over the top of them. It, the only thing you could do is you, you can take them over, as Brother Gruder was talking about. That is literally it. So, you know, a co-op model, that would, in my opinion, would work the best. Uh, something that could work for the whole United States and, and really the whole world, because this is it, they're making everybody suffer because of this. Uh, Devin, Ross and Jonah, please, please, please feel free to chime in. How do, you, how do you rate the performance of your union leadership in these negotiations? Is, is there discord between rank and file and union leadership over this? Or like, like how do you rate their performance in these negotiations? I'll, I'll jump in first, Devin, and, and I know you have things to say. I'd say largely that the, the reason we got to this point was because of the rank and file. It was because uh, brothers and sisters in, in four different unions stood up and said, no, enough is enough. And uh, I give a lot of credit to the BMWED for, for organizing themselves inside and, and pushing and, and getting the demand lifted up because the, the leadership wasn't lifting up demands at the end. They were trying to soft sell us on how good this contract was. And instead, they should have been going to Congress and doing the work of getting us more. And it was largely folks, rank and file folks in the BMWED that were pushing that uh, effort. And Devin, I hope you, you talk about that. Uh, 
I am I am deeply disappointed in in union leadership. They have failed us in this this moment, frankly. And if we are going to do better in the future, we're going to have to find ways to do it differently so that we can win. Um, Yeah, I can jump in there. Look, so leadership has failed us somewhat, right? They have done some good things, right? In the past, in the BMWED, in my union, uh, they had this CAT program, which was a communication action team. Basically, it was mobilizing the membership, right? It was communicating with the membership. It was organizing internally. That's what you should be doing in a union, right? If you're not ready to mobilize, you're not ready to, I mean, you, you can't just uh, expect your workers to walk out on strike, right? You, you can't just gain any kind of support and, and scare the railroads or scare any company from just walking in the door and saying, hey guys, we're going to go. Like nobody respects you. They don't know you. So you got to earn that. And and that's being done. And, and you know, we have kind of stopped doing that, but there is a rank and file uh, caucus that has um, kind of taken that upon ourselves to, to start doing that now. But um, as Brother Gruders was talking about, the, look, the, the reason why it happened, uh, and I've talked with uh, Jonah about this as well, but this really, it, like, I give Jonah a lot of credit because he's the one who, who connected this and made the networking happen. The progressive uh, people in, in the house and the staff members made it all happen that the sick leave was even in there. Otherwise, the sick leave was not going to be a part of it, right? Biden came out on Monday. Pelosi came out on Monday. They both said, oh, we're going to hammer this thing down and uh, we're not going to stop freight and uh, we're not going to start any legislation that has any poison pills in it. And AKA those poison pills that that her, uh, her statement said, that was the sick days. That's poison pills, she considered that. That is disgusting. <laughs> so, yeah, the- <laughs> The <laughs> poison yeah. pill is uh, getting us. Yeah, day. it's wild, man. It's it's I, I couldn't even believe it when I saw it. Like, look, you guys actually work for your constituents. There's no way. How many congressmen and women out there actually work for their constituents? Very little. So I give them a lot of credit in the progressive caucus for actually getting that thing going. And, and even though it failed in the Senate, look, this is a historic moment for us. It passed in the House to get something more than the PEB. Uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that's ever happened before. That's astounding, especially for railroads. Maybe in uh, the airline industry there has, but it's pretty wild. So if you go back and you look at the history of PEBs, it's kind of gross and disgusting. You basically just take what you get. And, uh, you know, so so this was, a, you know, we didn't win the sick days, but look, it was it was a win anyways, in, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Jonah, if you could uh, speak on this, I mean, like as far as the House Progressive Caucus goes, I mean, I, I know like AOC and Jamal Bowman, they've co- they've come in for a lot of criticism for like separating the sick leave from the the main agreement, which is sort of a, like they, Pelosi did a similar thing with the Build Back Better thing, where you you take out essentially the things people want, and you say if you vote for this bill, then uh, you know it, it, trust me, the second vote is coming. Uh, but like you're you know uh, as Devin just said, and and Jonah, like you you're, you're not hearing a, a similar like level of criticism for people who are involved inside this 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 labor uh, dispute yeah I mean I think I think I'll just say part of the focus on you know people on Twitter on the squad is they feel like that's their people they can have an influence on so they're kind of you know looking at looking at your own crew and trying to feel like where can I really play it but I, I, that's not really where any of this happened that was all you know we were on the the, the fourth down goal line no time left on the clock and they threw the Hail Mary. The deal was if you vote for the TA, then you get a vote on the sick days. There was no deal where you vote on a TA with sick days. This was not on the table. They got the sick days back on the table through, honestly, public pressure and some internal maneuvering. And it's nice they had a vote. But this thing was cooked through uh, years of this process. And I just, you know, Devin and Ross are two very brave members who will talk about their union leadership. I, I get to be on the sidelines and sort of tell you what other people are telling me in the rank and file membership of these unions. There's a lot of people who feel like the strategy to have put all your eggs in the Joe Biden basket for three years, say, we're going to wait till the Democrats are in power. Once they get into power, we're going to rush all the way through the process. You know, if you look at this process, they got released from mediation, like with, you know, the fastest time ever. The reason they went for that is because it's Democrats. And we think we can gamble on the Democrats for a good deal. They got all the way to the end where now Joe Biden is supposed to deliver. And their whole strategy has been, we're not going to strike. We're not going to 
talk to any other Democrats or progressives or do any outside agitation because we're playing the inside game with Joe Biden. So the moment that he turns around and says, nah, we're not doing sick days, we're not doing anything, we're imposing a contract, there's no strike, they have no other cards to play. They've put it all with Joe Biden. So I think if there's a criticism to make here, it's that you can't have, you know, something notable, it's, it's in the weeds, but Multiple unions didn't strike, even though they hit their strike dates with no tentative agreement in place. Multiple unions agreed to new tentative agreements just to trigger more cooling off periods because they weren't ready to rely on the membership to actually fight. And they didn't have a plan for legislation besides whatever Joe Biden's going to give us. You could have easily had a deal where there's a bill in Congress that says, you know what? If they strike, we're going to force them back to work, but it's going to be with 15 sick days, cost of living adjustment, and free health care. How do you like that, railroads? The railroads would have taken that very differently if they thought that's where Congress was going to go. But the unions and the Democratic Party said, we're just going to play it safe, play it inside. And then when the obvious thing happened, they basically said, we can live with it. So I get the focus on the progressives, and, and it's interesting to talk about, but there was like there was no no time left on the clock, and that was by design, and it was a and bad I think strategy. You, I, I think Jonah is exactly right here, uh, and and what I say when I say leadership failed us is is what Jonah is talking about. Uh, we didn't have any internal organizing to ensure that people were ready to strike, like Devin's talking about. Uh, my union leadership dissuades me from talking to Devin and people in his union, uh, even though we're both teamsters. Uh, and, and the, the work to build alliances and have an outside strategy where we leverage the people that have come to the table and fought for us in the recent weeks, all this public support we've gained, that was gained because of folks like, like within the BMWED rank and file caucus and because of folks at RWU, rank, Railroad Workers United. That didn't happen because of our rail unions. And so without that extra work being put in, this is always going to be the inevitable result. And that's what I say when I mean that union leadership has failed us and we need to find a way to do something different to win. Like we've talked about the start, like this is the, this is like the, this week was the culmination of about three years of back and forth on this issue. Like, okay, we've, we've reached a point now with this tentative agreement, but what about where, I mean, Ross, Devin, where do you in your where, when you're, you're rank and file or what you're trying to do in your unions? Uh, where do you go for the next three years? Like, I, am I am I right that like 2025 is the next uh, like sort of session when this will like uh, these types of negotiations will come up again? I mean, where where do you go from here? Yeah, sure. I, you know, we got 23 months until our next negotiations start. I mean, this is a five year agreement. We went three years without an agreement, and by the Railway Labor Act. Uh, technically we don't have time limits because, uh, they don't want us to, uh, walk out or use any self-help. So, um, technically we weren't without a, uh, an agreement, but we were, we haven't had any raises or anything for three years. And so, uh, we have 23 months until we're, uh, back to the table doing the same process over and over, just bash your head over, uh, it's, it's wild. But uh, as far as organizing beforehand, yeah, like we got a lot of work to do and we need to push our leadership to do it. I think a major thing, and this is used in all kinds of organizations and, and not just unions, but um, unions, they do it too, where they just don't, they don't educate their membership on how to do things, right? They don't educate them. Hey, you want to do something? Start with the resolution, right? Uh, push it up, make a, make a petition and start pushing up the ladder, right? And getting those things changed within your own organization. And so people just don't know. They, they, it, they don't know that, which is, uh, you know, something that the RWU and, and uh, our caucus in the BMWED has started doing. Like we want to start educating our membership and, uh, you, you know, people like uh, Labor Notes and TDU, they all do great work too to, to start a reform caucus, something that will actually change you fundamentally because it's not going to happen uh, with your union leadership. Like you're not going to get union leadership that's played politics for how long to get to where they're at uh, to, to let somebody else take over the reins and start and start playing. Like they want to play those chess games. They're, they're going to play those chess games to, to stay where they're at. And it's really unfortunate, but you know, I, I think th- there is some really good leadership out here that we can get in these spots, but look, there's a hell of a lot of work to do and we have to start now. We need to organize inside and outside of our unions. Um, and yeah, that work doesn't start in, in two years. That work has got to happen now, like Devin's saying. And 
And I think a big piece of this is is just finding those those critical leverage points like like public ownership of the railroads, for instance, that we can scare the shit out of the carriers and and make them come to the bargaining table uh, with with some good faith. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd lift up that as uh, perhaps the, the next place that Railroad Workers United might uh, try to go. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I'll get this out of my system and just say, fuck Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he's the most pro-labor president we've ever had. <laughs> Amtrak Joe, he loves trains. I, I just want to say one other thing, just a shout out to you know, Devin and Ross are doing amazing work in their unions. There's also been in this fight a bunch of, you know, there's 12 rail unions here. Some of them really do not have a super active uh, membership. But through through this fight, I've met some amazing people. One of them is Reese Murtaugh, who is a the local lodge leader in Richmond, Virginia, local lodge 696 of the rail machinists. They represent about 5,000 members across the country. And he saw what happened with their, they were one of the unions that just moved their strike date with no plan. And he saw what happened and said, fuck it, I'm running for national president of my union. And this is like just a guy who works on the railroad and decided that it's time for change in his union. So it's really interesting to see, you know, there's going to be a lot of mobilization. There's going to be a lot of demoralization, but it's exciting to see people like Devin, Ross, Reese Murtaugh, who are actually making a plan to, we can fix up these unions to actually fight. And I do think twenty because of what happened this time around, twenty twenty five could be a lot different, or twenty twenty seven, however long they keep you guys waiting. I guess I'll just uh, close out with this. You you, you just mentioned uh, demoralization, Ross. At the beginning, you described uh, explaining how something can pass the Senate but not pass the Senate <laughs> because you need sixty votes instead of just a majority, and how that leads to uh, like a real sense of demoralization with like the democratic process, but. I mean, going and like, and also the conditions imposed by this agreement you mentioned will likely lead to worse rail service and more and more people just dropping away from working for railroads. But like, I mean, like, is there like out, out of those embers, like, it, it's just can sometimes you think demoralization or just sort of facing the bare stark facts of things lead to a better better organizing and like some of these reform caucuses that you've mentioned? I, I can go on that. Uh, look. I- I've gotten phone calls already. People extremely pissed off. My own local, other locals around that are are really upset. And uh, you know, even without the paid sick days, as as Brother Gruders was talking about, that like people are still going to be demoralized. Um, I, I've had people call me and say, "Man, if they thought I was sandbagging before, they haven't seen me now." I mean, look, <laughs> our membership—they're pissed. And it's not our job to make sure they're happy and to make sure that they're efficient. It's the railroad's job. They're our fucking bosses. They can do something about it. You know what? Money does talk. It's not all about pizza parties. You know, great. I love pizza just like anybody else. But come on now. Let's let's do something better. Let's make a better work environment. Let's not get pissed off and and send 300 executives to D.C. uh, the same day as there's uh, legislation going in to give us seven days of paid sick leave. Like, that's fucking ridiculous how much money did you guys spend on do- just doing that how was your lobster that night i mean this it's so frustrating and i share that same sentiment as as uh, brothers and sisters that i work next to every day but as as you were saying yeah look it's hard to get people to care because they feel so defeated that's the truth but if you can start getting organizing and start showing people that you actually care. I also got phone calls from people saying, thanks for everything you do, Devin. Like, uh, you know, we appreciate you. And this is from my local, right? Like th- these guys, they like me because they see that I give a shit and I care. Like, I, and I think this kind of stuff is fun, right? Like that's, I, I enjoy organizing, right? So uh, there are people out there that want to do that. There's plenty of them. Well, we just need to find those leaders and we need to raise them up and uh, give them a mic. And, and I think that can be done. I think it's very, very possible with, uh, you know, people like uh, Jonah and Labor Notes and, and, and Joe and uh, people at TDU that are really supporting rank and file action. Like, that's a beautiful thing. That's all about the education. And I think it can be done. And, you know, Gruders has a tougher time than I do. Honestly, the BLET is a, a whole different animal. And uh, I was kind of fortunate to to get the the reins handed down to me but um he's got a a lot harder battle and and we're going to help them as well 
And I guess just to close out, like uh, Ross, Devin, if uh, any of our listeners uh, want to learn more about either Railroad Workers United or BMW ED Teamsters or any of these uh, organizing struggles that you guys are, are involved in, uh, what should they do? Where should they go? Do you, can you direct them anywhere uh, for like, you know, if they want to contribute in any way, shape or form? Well, you can follow me on the, the Bird app at uh, Ross Gruters, as long as it exists, R-O-S-S-G-R-O-O-T-E-R-S. <laughs> And uh, railroad workers, uh, all one word at at railroad workers. Also, our website is railroadworkersunited.com, and you can join as a solidarity member for twenty five dollars a year. I'm going to plug that. Uh, that helps us keep doing the work. It helps us pay for our wonderful staff person Sigrid, and uh, appreciate all the support we've gotten in recent weeks. Let's keep it going and work together to to make these carriers pay. Uh, yeah, Railroad Workers United has been around for like 15 years. Like These guys have been organizing for a long time. Uh, we just started our caucus a little less than a year ago. So we're we're newborn compared to them, but we're ready for action. We're ready to, uh, to start going too. So, um, you know, our, ours is the rank and file United, uh, BMWED. Uh, we're a division of the Teamsters, just like Brother Ross's. And, you, you know, we're going to keep fighting and, and uh, hopefully people, you know, reach out. We're, we're looking for alliances. We're looking for that help. Uh, I think that's the next step. We really need to work on that, right? Getting getting other organizations involved. And the RWU has been doing doing good at that, right? They've, they've already got a bunch of people on board, but we need to do more of that, and, and our union leadership does too. And Jonah, we can find your work at Labor Notes. I'll leave it there for this bonus episode about uh, the railroads and the the wonderful people who operate them and keep that freight uh, moving around this great nation of ours. Ross Gruders, Devin Mance, Jonah Furman, I want to thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, Will. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys.